you know, we usually get started a minute after to let people log in. I can uh, blather in between. Um, we're happy to have Marino talking about the um, SO3 vortex equations uh, today. Um, we'll continue uh, next week. We're certainly going to take a pause by the time the carbon neutral topology conference comes along so that we don't compete with them. Um, I guess I'll let Marino take it away. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for the invitation and everyone for joining in uh, virtually or thanks to your avatars for being here. So uh, I'm going to tell you about the vortex equations over orbital agreement surfaces. Uh, maybe like I should say, you could ask like, why do this, right? Uh, so I guess in the 90s, this could have been written down, at least not by me since I was learning arithmetic that, during that, those years. But, uh, you know, for certain applications to three manifolds, uh, specifically cipher spaces, uh, which is uh, really what I would like to discuss uh, more towards the end of the talk, you sort of uh, need uh, to understand like the behavior of the vortex equations on cipher um, orbifolds. Uh, like, if it's like an ordinary Riemann surface that was like, has been very well studied from many different perspectives. Uh, the Orbifold case is like one of those movies where you know that the two main characters are going to end up being together at the end of the movie. I mean, there's always like a happy ending. So I'm just here to report that probably what you expected will happen does happen if you ever have cared to think about this story. But at least now we have like a place where you can just point to and like see the results. Uh, so, oops, just some references. Uh, in a way, uh, like the two main, uh, th like the paper can be regarded like as a linear combination of MOY, which is a, f a paper by Murav Kalsbadju, apologies for the misspelling there, and Noshva's uh, last name, uh, about the cyber within equations on cipher spaces, and also the Furuta Steer paper about uh, the Jan Mills equations over orbital Riemann surfaces. Uh, though I'll say a little bit more about MOY since there's still a part that I would like to finish and it's not in the paper, uh, in the paper that I'm going to tell you about today. Okay. Uh, but let me start just by recalling uh, what the SO3 vortex equations are, uh, sometimes also called non-abelian vortices. Um, Again, even if you haven't seen them, as long as you have seen the cyber within equations, uh, this is more or less like familiar, a familiar story. So for the SO3 vortex equations, uh, what you can like what you can do is like start with a U2 bundle, which I'm calling E over your Riemann surface. I'll tell you a little bit about the modifications in a second for the orbital case. Uh, you take a section of this bundle, uh, which I'm calling but upsilon. Okay, and then you take a connection, uh, you two connection on the bundle E. Now, we sort of follow the standard gauge theory tradition that uh, instead of looking at all the U2 connections, uh, you look at those connections which induce a predetermined connection on the determinant line bundle. Okay, uh, again, this is like a sim uh, familiar trick if you know in some sort of homology. And so the net effect of doing that, right, is that. Typically, the space of connections will be affine over one forms uh, with values in the Lie algebra. The Lie algebra would have been the Lie algebra of U2. But since you're fixing this uh, connection on the determinant, essentially, uh, the space of connections is affine over one forms with value in Lie algebra of SU2. But well known that Lie algebra of SU2 is isomorphic to Lie algebra of SS3. So this is why you typically call this like the SO3 vortex equations. Okay. So, the, the second equation just says that uh, with respect to the holomorphic structure uh, induced by the, this connection on E, the, the, this section uh, is a holomorphic section, okay? Uh, and the first equation, again, is similar to like the cyber within story or the abelian vortex equations if you have seen, seen them before. It's just like an equation for uh, that traceless part of the curvature of C. So that's like the, what the zero denotes here. It's not the full curvature, it's just like the traces part. And a quadratic term that you sort of built out of the section. 
Okay. So the section, like the details, I mean, they're not that different from the center um, things that you know. So hopefully this more or less looks uh, familiar to you. Okay. Now, uh, what's the adaptation that you would need if you were to think about this uh, from the orbital perspective? Well, so for me, an or, or rather for Furuta and Steer, uh, you can think of an orbital like, as your Riemann surface, just with some finite number of mark points. And to each of these mark points, uh, you sort of attach a multiplicity, which are like these positive integers a sub i that you see here. Now in the picture, like the idea is that if you look at a neighborhood of a singular point, right? Uh, locally, the neighborhood is sort of like the quotient, right? Of like, say, like the standard complex plane or like the unit disk uh, in R2 by uh, an action of uh, cyclic group action of order A, which again, if you want to be super concrete, you can just like say that C goes to E to the two pi I over A times C. Okay, so it's like a quotient of, of that. And that's why locally, this picture sort of tries to convey the fact that if you also thought about like, which metrics to use, like uh, near this orbital point, the metric has like naturally like a cone angle singularity, okay? And then um, the story for what an orbital line bundle is, uh, essentially it, like it's something similar in the sense that near the mark point, there's like a trivialization where like the orbital line bundle is just like the quotient of like a genuine line bundle by, uh, by a, secret, uh, a cyclic group action. So in this case, like the idea is that if you thought of W as like this coordinate for the fiber of like the genuine line bundle upstairs, uh, the group like it just gets multiplied by E to the minus two pi E B over A. So V is this new integer that you also have to attach to the orbital line bundle, uh, which you call the isotropy data. Okay, so again, like this picture is supposed to happen at each mark point. So really you should think of an orbital line bundle uh, just con like essentially it's like a genuine line bundle away from the uh, mark points and, and the mark points are characterized by this uh, extra numer combinatorial or numerical data, which are the isotropies, okay? Uh, the conventions of Furuta and Steer are such that uh, the isotropy is taken to be uh, between zero and A, okay? Which is what you see here. Uh, please feel to inter interrupt me because sometimes I may talk too fast. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, I'm putting blanks things here between each slide just in case there was a need to discuss something in more detail. So this is all uh, planned ahead of time. Now, uh, uh, so as I was saying, orbital bundles, uh, essentially you sort of, um, that. Uh, isomorphism class of the orbital bundle, of orbital line bundle, is determined by this isotropy data, by this collection of integers. And right, in the smooth case, like you would, like we know that topologically on a Riemann surface, like you would need like the first churn class, right? Now the first churn class there is sort of, can be defined in the same way, like for example, using churn vial theory on orbitals or whatever. Uh, now in this case, it sort of happens to naturally be a second commodity class with rational coefficients in general. Uh, which be a point carrier duality, you can just think of a, as, a, as a rational number if you want. And so a normal full line bundle has this uh, first churn class, which is a rational number. And if you subtract uh, this combination of pi's over a sub i's, uh, then you do get like an honest integer, uh, which MOY uh, called the background degree of the orbital line bundle. But obviously uh, C1 is, determines or is determined by the, the background degree once you know the isotropies, right? So really it's like in addition to the isotropies, you need like the churn class, okay? And then um, an orbital U2 bundle, which is a little bit more of what we care about today. Uh, well, again, if you were just like working over a smooth Riemann surface, uh, you wouldn't specify it uh, up to isomorphism by its determinant line bundle, right? Uh, but then, uh, uh, here in the orbital case, like the idea is that within uh, each isomorphism class, there's always like a representative that can be written as a direct sum of two orbital line bundles. So what that means is that in a, instead of like just adding an integer for each mark point, you now need like a collection of two integers, uh, which I'm calling B, I, 
plus minus, okay? Uh, which again are between zero and a sub i, where a sub i was like the multiplicity at each mark point. And obviously uh, the determinant yeah, of this orbital U2 bundle can be itself an orbital line bundle. So it has its own isotropy, V sub i, and like they are sort of related to the isotropies of the U2 bundle, uh, meaning that um, V sub i minus plus V sub i plus should be congruent with V sub i mod a i. And we'll have a, lot, a little bit of fun with this number theory at the end of the a talk when we talk about cipher manifolds. But uh, I'm just saying like, so there's a little bit of redundancy of how I'm writing things down here, but like what you should keep uh, from what I have said is that for orbital line bundles, you need like this collection of integers and for orbital U2 bundles, uh, you also need to know collections of pairs of integers um, to, to specify them in addition to the typical stuff that you would need them to specify on an ordinary Riemann surface. Uh, if you buy this, like, again, like the thing with orbifolds is like many things, like they just work by putting the word orbifold next to everything else that you did before in the typical proof. So like, essentially you can write like the SO3 vortex equations in the same way that I just wrote them before. Uh, you just have to interpret them in like the orbifold sense, but they more or less, uh, uh, follow a similar pattern. So essentially my idea is just to tell you like uh, like the important things that you need about to know about these moduli spaces so that we can move to three manifolds, which are potentially what's more fun for the majority of the audience. Okay. Uh, now, um, as always, right, uh, you strictly speaking want to study the solutions to the vortex equations up to gauge, right? Uh, now you can ask here, what's the appropriate gauge group uh, in this context? Just uh, again, for those of you have, who are more familiarized with the instant of homology constructions, uh, you sort of look at those automorphisms which preserve the induced connection on the determinant of E. So you look, uh, you work with the determinant one gauge group, okay? So you will look at solutions to that. So three vortex equations modulo this gauge group, okay? And if you do that, uh, there's a nice feature that uh, there's sort of like a residual symmetry of, on the moduli space. Namely, there's like a circle action on this moduli space that on the equivalent classes of solutions, uh, which just takes a, a pair connection uh, comma section and send it to connection comma e to the i theta times the original section, okay? And once you have like a group action, well, uh, like the first thing to ask is like, what are the fixed points of this action, right? And um, an obvious answer is that uh, some fixed points just come from taking the case where the section vanishes identically, right? If the section vanishes identically, you plug by epsilon equals zero into the or original equations and uh, you get like a projectively flat connection on the orbital uh, Riemann surface, okay? And so projectively flat connections uh, sort of appear naturally into this picture. What's a little bit more interesting is that uh, since you're looking at this uh, circle action, I mean, you're looking at the fixed points of the circle action up to uh, gauge equivalent classes. So there's a, a more interesting type of uh, fixed points that arise if you know Hitchin's paper about the self-duality equations on Riemann surfaces, uh, if that was the correct name, uh, it's essentially like the same story, uh, what I'm doing here like that Hitchin does, or like the uh, low dimensional version of like the, uh, the story for SO3 monopoles on four manifolds, if you know like the Pistrog and Turing or Figan and Ness's papers. But um, the idea is that um, you can, you get also abelian vortices as, as fixed points of this circle action. Uh, what's an abelian vortex in this context? It just means that uh, the U2 connection uh, sort of emits a reduction into a direct sum of two U1 connections. Since we're working with this paradigm of fixing the connection on, uh, on the determinant, sort of uh, what the connection has to be on the second factor is more or less fixed by whatever this connection is on the first factor. Uh, and so the bundle itself uh, would 
uh, reduced as a direct sum of two orbifold line bundles. And so the section, you can naturally like write it as, uh, the, uh, as uh, two summons one pair for each of these factors, right? Now, strictly speaking, I should put like alpha direct sum beta, right? Because like maybe like the, uh, the section is non is non vanishing on each of the two factors, but in fact, if you just work a little bit with the equations, you can see that uh, one of the two factors always has to vanish identically. So I'm just taking it to be the second one. Okay. So what that means is that uh, an abelian vertex here is like uh, uh, an orbifold line bundle with an orbifold connection with a uh, section of this line bundle. Uh, which satisfy the following equations. Uh, first, that alpha is again a holomorphic section with respect to the holomorphic structure induced by this U U1 connection. And then again, like a curvature equation, uh, an equation for the curvature uh, of, of this connection uh, and also like a quadratic term of, of the section. Okay, now, uh, Again, like this uh, billion vortex equations have been studied extensively by like Jaffe, Tavs, Garcia, Prada, and many others. So this is not different from uh, what's going on there. Uh, what's maybe very important to mention at this, in this context, which is a blessing and a curse, uh, depending on what you're doing, is that when you go through the, 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 the simplifications of the equations at, at these solutions, uh, sort of like the, you always get like a term on this abelian vortex equations, which involves uh, one half of the curvature on the fixed uh, connection on the determinant of E. So in a sense, like the abelian vortex equations are naturally perturbed uh, by like your choice of uh, curvature or by the choice that you made at the beginning uh, uh, on the on the curvature, uh, on, the connect, on the reference connection on the determinant of E. And so, again, this is good, at least for certain things, because for example, that already gives you like a bound for how large the churn class um, of these orbifold line bound bundles can be if they are to arise at the, uh, 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 in one of these moduli spaces. So it says that the churn class cannot be bigger than one half uh, the churn class of E. Uh, and that it's always non-zero. Uh, that's more or less so like true for like more uh, evident reasons. But in any case, the, the point is that uh, the fact that this curvature term appears here, it gives you like a bound, uh, an upper bound on how large C1 of the bundle can be, okay? And if you were to be in, if you could also be interested in what happens if this also like alpha vanishes identically. So, um, and you'll see why once we move to the three manifold story, why this is also important. Well, if alpha vanishes identically, I mean, you just plug in alpha equals zero here, right? Like uh, this already tells you that uh, C1 of L is one half of C1 of E. Now in the, in the smooth case, right? If you were working with an honest to God Riemann surface, uh, the trick that you can do to get rid of this uh, possibility is just like uh, assuming that E is a U2 bundle with odd degree, right? Like that C1 is like a, a not number. Well, after you apply for carrier duality, right? Uh, now for rational numbers, like uh, that's less clear, like how, like how you can say this like in a useful way. But if you assume that the AIs, these multiplicities at the Riemann surface, are co-prime, mutually co-prime. Uh, Furuta and Steer show that there's like essentially like sort of like a line, orbifold line bundle that generates all the others in the sense that any other orbifold line bundle is like a tensor product of this fundamental one. And this one has like sort of like the minimal non-trivial churn class, which is one over the product of the multiplicities. And so the replacement for being of odd degree in this case, which is by the way, like the most interesting one for the applications I want to tell you a bit later, is just saying that you're choosing uh, the de determinant of E to be an odd power of this uh, fundamental orbifold line bundle. And that sort of like, is like the orbifold version of like the odd degree condition 
in the in the smooth case. Okay, so there's sort of like a way to prevent uh, solutions where alpha vanishes identically. The reason why you want to do this is because like solutions with with alpha identically zero have more stabilizer. Uh, with respect to the gauge group, so they would represent like singular points in the moduli space. Okay, so you want to like you, I do like smooth manifolds. What can I say? So I want to prevent this from happening. <laughs> so, uh, following the gauge theory terminology, anything that's not a fixed point of this S one action, I'll just call it an irreducible S O three vortex, and so. It's sort of like, again, somewhat standard to just prove, um, even in the or orbital case, that at an irreducible SO3 vortices, like the modular space is smooth manifold, uh, in fact, a Kähler manifold, uh, and it has a complex dimension. I wrote it a complex dimension because I didn't want a, a big number to multiply in everything here. So uh, the complex dimension of this uh, Kähler manifold, uh, the irreducible vort vortices is just, uh, this contribution, which you can just think as a global contribution that's coming from the genus or, or the degree of, of the YouTube bundle, and like some more localized contributions which come from the uh, like the multiplicities and the isotropies of the YouTube bundle. Okay, so the point is that there's like a formula for for like the expected dimension of the moduli space. By this, I mean that, you know, like you sort of follow the standard thing that you write like a deformation complex, there's like a coordination model. And what I'm saying is like H2 vanishes at the irreducible SO3 vortices, okay? Now, if you are in this like sort of analog of the odd K, odd condition, odd degree condition where like you don't have solutions with alpha identically zero, uh, it's also easy to show that uh, the, the moduli space is sort of smooth at the at, at the abelian vortices. What's a little bit more tricky is to show uh, that the moduli space is smooth at the flat connections. That requires the, the vanishing of some cohomology groups, uh, of some uh, of a shift cohomology group. Uh, but there's like a standard way in algebraic geometry to guarantee its vanishing, which is by assuming that the degree of the bundle is sufficiently large. Uh, something similar can be done in either the smooth or orbifold case. So if you assume that the churn class of E is at least twice as big as the churn class of the canonical line bundle, uh, which is like the forms of type one zero, then uh, the modular space is an honest to God uh, smooth manifold at, 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 at all the solutions, okay? And so this, uh, I'll, I won't make this assumption for now, but I'll use, uh, you'll see that it comes in a, a bit later in a very nice way once we discuss the three manifold story, which I'm almost getting there. So uh, no worries if, if you were eager to learn about uh, here that. Okay, so just keep in mind that uh, if you, this is like the philosophy. Also, if you come from like the algebraic geometry world, make the degree large and your life will be happy. Make the degree small and you may be a bit more miserable. So if you make you large enough, like everything sort of starts working better, you know, like this is similar to like the existence of ASD connections that Taos had proven once like the C2 of the bundle is sufficiently large in, Yami, in the AZ case or like uh, Donaldson has some paper about the, the moduli spaces for Kähler manifolds. And so everything sort of works a lot better once you make the degree sufficiently large. Some, something similar happens here. And a uh, final slide of the vortices. Uh, there's an, uh, another nice thing here is that there's like a natural Morse bot function that you can write uh, in this story, which again, like this more or less like the, like essentially the same as what Hitchin had done many years ago. But it's just like one half like the L2 norm of the section. Uh, the reason why this is like a, a nice, uh, a nice function to look at is because it, you can interpret it as a moment map for the S1 action. So if you know what moment ma maps are, great, beautiful. If not, don't worry. Uh, the important thing is that here, like the critical points of this more spot, uh, I mean, it ends up being a more spot function and the critical points uh, just are in correspondence with the fixed points of the S1 action. So in this case, the critical points are just a predictable flat connections, which are like obviously like not absolute minima for this function and abelian vortices, okay? 
and there's a theorem due to Frankel that essentially uh, gives you like a way to compute the Morse plot index of this function uh, just in terms of like the weights of the circle action. So this formula we won't need really, but I just mention it uh, in case you want to look at it. Uh, there's a similar formula, uh, obviously, in a more complicated case in the recent paper of Figan LNS for SO3 multiples on Taylor surfaces, if you want to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm just saying that uh, you sort of find a natural Morse plot function in this moduli space, and it's actually useful for the following reason. So I'm not just mentioning this because I could like speak for five more minutes. Because like uh, it gives you like a fun way to show that certain moduli spaces are empty. So if you're just working with uh, ordinary Riemann surfaces, like it's sort of easy to see that like in general, like these moduli spaces of SO3 vortices are always non-empty. But over orbifolds, you actually have to be more careful. There are like situations where like they just happen to be empty many times uh, because you can play ar around with the isotropies and so of, of the U2 bundles. And so the, the reason why uh, a re uh, easy way to see why they have to be empty is that uh, if the U2 bundle or the modular space admits no abelian vortices, right, then the, the, this Morse plot function has nowhere to take its maps, right? Uh, so essentially what that means is that the, if you know that the, a priori that the modular space is not, uh, that there are no po possibilities for abelian vortices to belong to this modular space, then that tells you the, the modular space of irreducible SO3 vortices has to be empty, essentially. So uh, again, I'll say more about this at the end of the talk for the cipher manifolds, but you'll see that it, uh, this was a plot to the movie uh, where I thought the characters were always getting a divorce. So you see that sort of like, they happen to be a lot more empty than I would have uh, guessed. But it's uh, one reason to see this is, uh, one reason to see it is because of that. Another uh, reason to see it is like if you compute the expected dimension, it also gives you negative. But I mean, I think it's more elegant to just like look at it from the perspective of the like non existence of abelian vortices inside the moduli space. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, hopefully, any questions, please feel free before I move to three manifolds. <laughs> mm, Jesus. Perfect, 30 minutes, excellent, just as planned. Uh, let's talk about SO3 monopoles on three manifolds. Um, again, uh, as probably many of you are aware, um, SO3 monopoles have been like a set of equations uh, proposed by Pichard and Turin to relate on four manifolds the Donaldson invariance to the cyber Witten invariance, like in with pure, like in, as, as, they, as they appear in Witten's conjecture, right? Uh, and then, like over the years, Figa and Lanetz have have been like the ones who have been uh, working uh, the details or all the details of this approach. But uh, so there are like an interesting set of equations, and I'll tell you like just some quick facts about them of how they behave on on three manifolds. In case you have never, uh, if you haven't seen this before, but now since you have heard the story for vortices, you'll see it's more or less like the same stuff. So, you know, for the cyber within equations, you need a spin C structure. Uh, for the for writing the SO three monopole equations on a three manifold, you need the, a spin U structure. Okay, so concretely. Uh, one way, which is not the most intrinsic way to define them, is that you can take you can think of a, a spin U structure as being represented by a bundle, which you can just take as a tensor product of a, the, a spinner bundle, right, uh, corresponding to a spin C structure, uh, like the ones that you would use to write the cyber with any equations, and a U2 bundle E, uh, which you could you should think of being like the bundle that you would use to like define some sort of instant tensor homology on your three manifold, right? So you sort of put together the bundle used to define cyber width equations with the bundle used to define uh, instant of flow homology. You tensor them, and that's your uh, that's a representative for a spin U structure. Uh, now this is, as I'm saying, not like an intrinsic characterization because, like for example, if you just happen to tensor S with a complex line bundle and E with L inverse, right? Like that's more or less the same isomorphism as a, a, a spin U structure as the one before. But it's like a simple exercise in characteristic classes that if you define these two characteristic numbers uh, in this way or these characteristic classes, they sort of are independent of the uh, of this particular 
decomposition of the spin u structure. Okay, so on a three manifold, in fact, uh, this is more or less all that you need. So, um, at, uh, like um, C1 of t and W2 of t, uh, t is like the name for the spin u structure in the same way in which s, fancy s, is like the name for spin c structure. So, those two characteristic number classes are like the ones that pin down like an isomorphism class of spin u structure. Uh, they have also like sort of like a natural Clifford map. Which you just take from the Clifford map on the spin C structure and just tensor it to be like the identity on that E factor. Okay. And for example, on an integer homology sphere, which I care about, and I'll tell you a bit later later today, uh, like there's really like just like one isomorphism class of spin Q structures, right? Uh, 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 essentially, in the same way in which there's only like an isomorph, like just a, a unique spin C structure and a, and a integer homology sphere. Okay, and Y is the name here for the three manifold. So it's like just this bundle over the three manifold. Okay. And so what are the SO3 monopole equations? It is essentially what you would expect and now that you saw the story about vortices. So you take a section psi of this spin U structure, right? So it's a section of S tensor E. I'm just working with a particular representative. So if you also fix a uh, reference spin C connection on S, uh, you can sort of like make the space of connections to be essentially the same space of connections that you would use for instanton floor homology. So essentially like just, you know, like some connections on this bundle E, which induce a particular U2 connect, a particular U1 connection on the determinant. And so the, the, the spin, like the SO3 monopole equations, is just saying that, that this section satisfies the Dirac equation with respect to this twisted Dirac operator. There's an, an implicit dependence here on the uh, reference spin C connection as well. But so it's just saying that it's harmonic with respect to the Dirac operator. And again, like um, the, there's like an equation for the traceless part of the curvature, uh, which involves a, a quadratic term, uh, which is essentially like. Uh, Mutatis mutandis, like constructed similarly to how the quadratic term is uh, done in, in in the cyber Witten story. So, like the details of how it's constru constructed is not that important. The zero zero just means that it's sort of traceless on each of the two factors of like the endomorphisms, uh, but it's not too important. I'm just saying that it uh, probably looks like all the equations that you have ever looked at previously in your life. Okay, so it's like a Dirac equation plus a curvature equation. And um, again, if you just look at the modular uh, solutions to these equations, modulo the gauge group, which again, you can take the gauge group to be uh, essentially the same gauge group that you would use in instant and floor homology. So like the determinant one gauge group, the fixed points of an S1 action, which is literally the same as the one that I mentioned before, just taking the spinner psi to e to the i theta psi. If you look at the fixed points under um, the gauge equivalence classes, the solutions are, well, projectively flat connections. I mean, I missed the word projectively here, right? Um, and uh, our good friends, the uh, cyber with the monopoles. So again, that just means that uh, the spinner, like the, uh, the like here is just like that the bundle E has reduced into a direct sum of line bundles. Uh, I mean, and so it, it's just something like, like this. So I'm just saying that you you write the the spinner as a as a, as a summon of two things um, where psi lives in the first thing uh, in the first direct sum and uh, again like a psi prime would live in the second direct sum but like again if you work down the details like you'll see that one of the two vanishes identically so let you take the third, second one to be the one that vanishes all with, all the time and you recover um, the the uh, the the cyber Witten equations, but uh, similar as as I told you happens in the SO3 vortex story, the equations that you get here are perturbed by a curvature term coming from the connection on the, the fixed connection on the determinant bundle. Okay, so you never get sort of like the naked cyber Witten equations on the three manifold, even if you haven't added more perturbations to the, you know, like the SO3 monopole equations can also be perturbed. But even if you haven't perturbed those, it's sort of uh, their effect on the cyber Witten equations is to perturb the cyber Witten equations, even if sort of you didn't want to. And so just if you come from the cyber Witten world, 
you could ask when do reducible cyber window solutions arise? Uh, you may remember that a reducible cyber width and monopole is one where the spinner psi, little psi, vanishes identically, right? And well, the only way that this could happen um, is for the top W2 of adjoint of E to be zero. And so if now, if you know like a little bit of instant of flow homology, you know, you know that on three manifolds with first uh, positive first very number, uh, this is sort of like not the assumption that one makes on W2 of E in order to define like the instant of floor homology, meaning that like for the usual U2 bundles that one looks at in practice, like there are never solutions where psi vanishes identically. Uh, in other words, like these perturbations have the effect that they kill all the reducible cyber with the monopoles, even if the spin C structure is torsion. Okay, so there's a name for these perturbations in Kronheimer and Rofka's book, uh, and they're called non-balanced perturbations. Okay, so what I'm just trying to say is that when the first betting number is positive, sort of in the usual context, uh, the, F, the net effect on the cyber equation equations is that uh, you have killed like solutions with vanishing spinner. Okay, so this is quite useful to keep in mind for what I'm about to say and then next few slides. Okay. Uh, now let's move to examples. So uh, first example that I want to discuss is like how the SO3 monopoles behave on S1 cross sigma. I think again, here I should just preface everything by saying that even if you look at the instant like flag connections on S1 cross sigma or like the cyber within equation in S1 cross sigma, like, you know, like the critical sets or the solution sets are uh, high, like in general are uh, non-zero, not zero dimensional despite the fact that there's like sort of like a generic argument that like um, if there were transversality, right? Like this should be cut, uh, this should be zero, zero dimensional moduli spaces. So it's just that uh, if you have a perturbative equation, so you don't have transversality. So uh, you just like uh, may have uh, solution, like solutions that come in, in family, in higher dimensional manifolds. So as you might expect, uh, I mean, if you have studied the, the behavior of cyber within equations or flag connections on S1 cross sigma, like a similar story happens for um, the SO3 monopole equations. So again, there's like a canonical spin C structure on S1 cross sigma, which typically in, in I guess in uh, the convent like the conventions uh, people write as like a, a direct sum of the trivial complex line bundle with um, the can anti canonical line bundle, uh, which is just like the forms of type zero, zero one on sigma. Okay, uh, that, that like that those details do not matter too much. It's just I'm just saying like on on as one cross sigma, there's sort of like a canonical spin C structure. And then you just censor it with your favorite U2 bundle, E, which I'm assuming it sort of comes from the, uh, it's like a, there's some pullback implicit in everything that I'm writing here. So like this U2 bundle sort of like a pullback of an U2 bundle defined over sigma. Okay. And so if you do that, then you can think of this canonical spin U structure as like, uh, well, C tensor E is just E and this other thing, uh, is K inverse tensor E. Okay, so it's like, uh, you can think of it as just like a direct sum of these U two U2 bundles. Okay, and so with respect to this um, decomposition, uh, psi breaks into two summons, uh, alpha and beta. Okay, and again, there's sort of like a vanishing result. Um, I should, I guess it's practice to put your name somewhere in things that you prove. So uh, since Mike Miller already uses ME for his acronyms, I'll take advantage of the fact that my two last names are the same. So I'm writing me squared. So uh, you can prove sort of like the same vanishing results that happen on Kähler surfaces uh, for cyber Witten equations, which was first shown by Witten or uh, for SO3 monopoles, this was shown by Docker, which was one of Kronheimer students. But essentially what happens is essentially what happens all the time. So like, if you just go through the details, like one of these two sections vanishes identically, okay? So if beta, if beta vanishes identically, uh, essentially the solution is in, can be identified with an uh, honest SO3 vortex on the, on, the, on the bundle E over the Riemann surface, okay? And if alpha vanishes identically, there's some, uh, duality argument that you have to do. But uh, 
the solution can be ident identified with an SO3 vortex on K tensor E dual. So I'm just, uh, essentially, it's the dual of the second factor that you see here. Um, so it's not a typo. So, um, so essentially, like, what's going on is that if you haven't perturbed the equations again, uh, the modulate space of SO3 monopoles on S1 cross sigma is just like a, a two moduli spaces uh, can be identified with two moduli spaces. One, which is a moduli space of SO3 vortices on E over the Riemann surface, and the other, which is a moduli space of SO3 vortices on uh, K uh, sigma tensor E, e dual. Okay, and they sort of meet at the moduli space, uh, they intersect at the moduli space of flat connections, or projectively flat connections. And so here's the cool thing. Uh, if you assume that the degree is sufficiently large, which was this condition that I mentioned at, almost at the beginning of the talk, which again, you need if you want to make this moduli space uh, smooth manifolds at least uh, in this, uh, at the, at the flat connections, then these solutions always disappear. There are no solutions with alpha identically zero. Uh, because as like, you can look at it from the dimension formula, the idea is that like, you have these two moduli spaces, but, but what? By making the degree of E larger, you're increasing the dimension of the moduli space of vortices on E, but the other one involves E dual. So you break, you're bringing down the dimension of mod, uh, moduli spaces of SO3 vortices on K sigma times E dual. And so at some point, once you make this one large enough, this one, you, you, get, you get it to the territory where it becomes zero or like negative dimensional. So by making the degree sufficiently large, you sort of get rid of uh, um, one of the two types of solutions, which is like a cool fact um, to bear in mind. Like I like it just because it's sort of like the same condition that you would use for guaranteeing that the modular space uh, on E was uh, smooth, okay? Uh, I sense if someone going to ask something. Uh, and so like the point is like, if you make the degree large enough of the U2 bundle, then like really you only get solutions uh, in projection with SO3 vortices on E. Why am I mentioning this? If this was a talk, uh, I mean, I'll go to the orbital part uh, very soon, but just quickly, here's some food for thought. <laughs> so there's this conjecture by Kronhammer and Mrufka uh, relating the fl frame instanton flur homology, which was known as HM tilde of Y, which is the one of the flavors of monopole flur homology, which uh, is also happens to be isomorphic with HF hat of Y. Uh, this is like the Hegar flur version. Uh, this isomorphism, right? Like by Kutu Klen Litas or Colin Kijini Honda. Uh, but uh, if you haven't seen this before, how is, uh, let's, I prefer the instantons. So let's start with what the instantons are supposed to be defined like. H, this frame group, uh, HI sharp of Y, essentially what you do is like you take the connected sum of Y with T3 and choose like an appropriate U2 bundle who's uh, uh, represented by the Poincaré dual by like one of the factors, so as one factors of the, of the T3. And, that sort of group has like an involution. I mean, it would have been like C mod eight, uh, C mod eight graded, uh, has like eight summons, uh, like, but there's like an involution. You just keep like sort of four, four of them. Uh, it's like the eigenspace of some U map or whatever. Uh, and so this is what I mean by one half of HI of Y tensor uh, connected some T3. Okay. So uh, like the point is like what you need to know from what I have just said is that you define it by taking the connected sum with T3, okay? So being a simple individual, like I might just ask, well, so what does this loop group look like uh, for S3, right? And so for S3, what this means is that you're taking the connected sum of S3 with T3, but that's sort of like T3, right? And so you're just looking at the instant of flow homology of T3 and you're keeping just half of that. And so essentially uh, in this case, it's uh, very concrete. And there's like originally for this instant of flow homology, there were, there were only two generators. And uh, so there are no differentials. And, and so when you keep one half of them, uh, you just get like a one dimensional group. Uh, I should add that the, at the level of Euler characteristics, this equality had been shown by Chris Caruto. And uh, in, there's like a conjecture for the suture version, which uh, I think at the level of Euler characteristics, Chen Kun Li and Pan Ye had shown recently. So at least for Euler characteristics, this is known that the groups are isomorphic and there are certain examples where they have been verified. 
the isomorphisms have been verified. Okay, but in any case, so at least for S3, uh, the, the framed instant homology of S3 is just one dimensional and it, you just have to look at the ordinary homo instant homology of T3. But T3 is S1 cross T2, right? And so I just told you about S1 cross sigma Riemann surface. So what happens, this sort of begs the question of how the moduli space of SO3 monopoles behaves on S1 cross T2, right? And so by that, by the correspondence that I mentioned earlier, what you need to look at is, uh, you need to look at the moduli space of vortices on the Riemann surface. Now, in the, in the case of T2, like sort of like the degree condition is almost satisfied for the easiest case meaning for degree of E equals one. So already for degree of E equals one, uh, you sort of only have like vortices on E, like meaning that there's no um, second factor here because uh, this is trivial for, uh, for T2. And so what this is saying is that if you just plug in you know, like the expected dimension, dimension formula of this moduli, uh, uh, if you compute the dimension formula uh, for SO3 vortices on T2 for a bundle with degree one, it just gives you two before taking the quotient by the S1 action. And you have this Morse function uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. It's Morse plot in general, but here there's actually just a unique abelian vortex and a unique flat connection. So you have, uh, you can give this like to an undergraduate who's taking Morse theory, right? You have a Morse function with a unique max and a unique mean on a two-dimensional manifold, compact two-dimensional manifold, uh, smooth and everything, no boundary. And that has to be like a sphere. And then like after you take the quotient, uh, but then uh, this residual S1 action that, that gives you like a, sort of like a one-dimensional cobordism between the abelian vortex and the uh, flag connection. Okay, but then this flag connection, you can uh, sort of naturally, you can regard as a generator for this uh, frame group on, on, on S3 and so the frame homology of S3. And so, you, uh, and this abelian vortex actually is also in correspondence with the unique solution to the cyber witten equations on T3. Now, you might say, this is weird. Why is there like a unique solution to the cyber witten equations? Because uh, remember, as I mentioned earlier, the, like the cyber witten equations that you look at uh, from the SO3 monopole point of view is sort of naturally perturbed by this curvature term. So, with this perturbation, there's only one solution to the cyber within equations, which only happens at the torsion spin C structure. There's no more solutions. Uh, one can show that. So if you had defined in a parallel universe, like a framed monopole floor homology to have been just like HM of Y connected sum with T3, with this perturbation term omega, which comes from this curvature on the determinant uh, line bundle, then what this would have been telling you is that uh, this frame monopole floor homology is uh, one dimensional, right? And sort of this uh, moduli space of uh, SO3 monopoles or SO3 vortices more precisely would have provided like a natural cobordism uh, between the two generators of, of, the, of this frame monopole floor homology and this uh, frame instant on floor homology, at least in the case of S3. Uh, now, so the obvious question to ask is like, so how is this related to HM tilde, right? How is like this definition related to the original definition of HM tilde? So there's like a Kunet formula in one of the papers by Kutuklan, Lee, and Taos that essentially show you that uh, this, re this is like an other way of redefining HM tilde. This is also something that Kronheim and Rufka probably other people knew in the field. So, um, so like in this sense, like at least in the small case of S3, now I like to think of the equality between the groups as being a consequence of like having studied the moduli spaces of vortices on, on T2. Um, will this give you any insight for complicated three manifolds? Well, I don't know, 100% sure. Hence like the slide being called food for thought, but I think it, there could be something interesting going on. But uh, so this is like a, I think it's like an interesting application or observation of why you and spend some time writing these vortices, uh, these moduli spaces. Um, 
Now, let me perhaps in the few minutes uh, that I have left. Yeah, yeah, quick, just... quick question. Uh, so uh, you have one dimensional modular space on the three manifold, right? Uh, the SO3 multiple modular space would have been one dimensional, which is not, uh, which is abstracted, right? Correct. It's not. Uh, uh, but uh, if you use a generic, generic small perturbation, what happens to this art? Do you know if it gives it uh, completely or there are some points left or? I, I have no idea what would happen, but yes, I think that's like the million dollar question or well, maybe it's not like a millennium price, but yeah, it's something that needs to be figured out, correct? Before one can say more useful things. But yeah, that's something I would like to think more about. Yeah, yeah. But because right, as you were saying, like this is like a, a nice consequence of the fact that you, you haven't preserved anything. Like, I don't know how much you sort of can re keep, uh, re what, how much data you can keep if you have to start perturbing things, yeah. Well, maybe you can uh, only allow some special perturbations. That right, right, right. Yes, yes, yes. But good, good, good. Thanks. That's a good point. <laughs> good. Just for the end of the talk, uh, let's talk about MOI for SO3 monopoles. So now let's look at cipher manifolds. Uh, this is another interesting class of three manifolds. Uh, the pragmatic uh, convenient way for, for me to think about them is how Furuta and Sear do it in their paper, meaning that you have like an orbital line bundle over an orbital Riemann surface, and you can just look at the circle bundle of, of that uh, orbital line bundle. And like, again, like in many situations like you care about, like that's just like a, a genuine three manifold. Uh, for example, uh, if all the AIs are co-prime uh, and the base orbital Riemann surface is topologically S2, is, this is like what you would call the manifold sigma A, A1 through A sub N. When there's three multiplicities, these are like the Briscoe homology spheres, who I know some of you have worked out, uh, a lot with over the years. So, like, they're sort of like nice examples uh, of, um, of three manifolds that fall within the class of cipher manifolds. The reason why this is interesting is that sort of you can adapt the geometry of the three manifold in such a way that it interacts naturally, nicely with this, like, uh, like the uh, cipher manifolds have like some sort of S1 action, right? And the quotient by the S1 action is sort of like the order rule. So like you can sort of like adapt the geometry as MOY does to, to this one S1 action. So there are some details that I'll, I'll skip because like it's more or less like adapting what they did. Uh, but you sort of like choose a, again, like a metric connection, which is compatible with this structure. Uh, by the way, this is what Nicolas Kuh, who also had some interesting papers about cyber within equations cipher cyber manifolds, would have called like an adiabatic connection. So anyhow, you sort of um, write things down so that uh, it, 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 it works nicely with the cipher structure. And there's like a canonic, again, even if uh, you're working on an integer homology sphere, as I said, before there's like just like a unique spin U structure up to isomorphism, but sort of like there's like a nice way to write it so that it interacts nicely with the cipher structure. So that's like how what I'm calling like uh, the can in this case, where like you sort of uh, there's this map pi like projection map, and you sort of pull back like the anti-canonical bundle of the Riemann surface uh, orbital Riemann surface, and you take the pullback of a U2 bundle over the orbital Riemann surface. And uh, again, like you sort of follow the same philosophy and you look at uh, the solutions to the SO3 monopoles equations here. And so just to try to get to, to some examples, which I really want to get to, again, uh, me squared. Uh, essentially, uh, you could, just as in the case of S1 cross stigma, you sort of decompose uh, the section into two factors and you have this vanishing result that uh, the solutions to the SO3 monopole equations only uh, have the property that either beta is identically zero or alpha is identically zero. Now, the cool thing here is uh, like essentially sort of like the solution, like say for example, if beta equals is identically zero, which is like the only case I'll care about for a reason I'll say soon, beta is identically zero, you sort of can identify this with an SO3 vortex on, over a U2 bundle over the orbital Riemann surface. The caveat is that this U2 bundle uh, may not be the one that I wrote in this pullback, just because like, you know, they could have different isotropies and they still pull back. I mean, sort of like when you pull it back, you, like the isotropy data uh, got lost in, this, in a sense. And so like the only thing that you can say is that this U2 bundle must have the, cert the same isomorphism class of the determinant uh, as the um, 
YouTube bundle that I use here for the pullback. Uh, that's because MOY proves like a, a, a bijection between uh, Orbifold connections and Orbifold line bundles and certain line bundles upstairs. So what I'm trying to say is that you sort of, instead of just looking at a single YouTube bundle over the Orbifold Riemann surface, now you have to look at all the YouTube bundles which have a particular determinant line bundle. So that becomes a cute game about uh, playing with isotropies, which I'll show you in like two minutes. And then like you could also have solutions with alpha equals zero, but again, like there's some certain duality which you could identify with the SO3 vortex on K sigma tensor E prime dual. And if you want to kill one of the two solutions, you sort of uh, can get rid of the second type but assuming that uh, C1 of the determinant is sufficiently large. So again, if you make this assumption, which is not the one that uh, MOY uh, MO did for like the cyber case, uh, a cyber within case, it's a little bit different their, their story. Uh, you sort of get like just like, a, you have to look at YouTube bundles over all the orbital. You have to look at the SO3 vortices over all the YouTube bundles with a certain determinant line bundle that satisfy this condition. Okay, so just to make things more concrete, let me exhibit this uh, in the next example. So, good friend, uh, sigma 235, Poincare homology sphere. Uh, so uh, this notation might, might be confusing because sigma is the name I have been assigning for Riemann surfaces, but right, I mean like sigma 235 in the sense like uh, of what I said that you have now like, uh, like the orbital Riemann surface is really S2, has three marked points, the multiplicities, multiplicities are two, three, and five. So that's what I'm calling A1, A2, A3. You, if you go through the Furuta Steer paper, since the uh, AIs are co-prime, right? There's this, orbital line bundle, which generates all the other orbital line bundles, which I'm calling L0. So again, L0 has uh, isotropies itself, which I'm calling V1, V2, V3. And the way in which you find them is just by requiring that this combination is an integer. If I had better number theory skills, maybe this is like a super easy way to see the answer. I just did it by trial and error. Boom, 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 boom. And you just get like, it's fun to see that like this forces V1, V2, V3 to V1 in this case. Okay, so this fundamental orbital line bundle in the case of uh, S2235 has churn class 1 over 30. Okay, uh, and in this case, the degree condition is uh, almost back to like this regularity assumption to kill one of the two possible solutions to the vortex equations because uh, it gives you a negative number. So you can just look at U2 bundles that have satisfy. Uh, the determinant is isomorphic to L0. You have to look at those because Furuta and Steer have also like a correspondence between projectively uh, uh, irreducible SU2 representations and U2 bundles over the Riemann surface whose determinant is like an odd power of this fundamental line bundle. So you did have to look at uh, like all odd multiples of L0. What I'm saying is that the first one that works uh, is like, like the obvious choice, which is just L0 itself. Uh, and then like there's a number theory question. Uh, as a YouTube bundle, I said, well, now we have to look at all the YouTube bundles with, with this determinant. So they can only differ in their isotropy data. So their isotropy data, again, were like these pairs of integers, pi plus minus. So what they have to satisfy is that, uh, I don't know if you remember the beginning of the story, is that vi plus, vi minus plus vi plus is congruent, uh, with the isotropy of the determinant, which is one in every in every of the mark points, so it's congruent with one mod a i. And again, you just do like a huge table. This is what I did. You have six cases to look at. These are all the possible uh, isotropies that work for these YouTube bundles, and you just start looking at ha what happens in every single case. So for this isotropy, uh, the expected dimension of the moduli space of SO3 vortices uh, is two. So it becomes one after you take the ocean by the S1 action. There's a unique projectively flat connection in, supported in this U2 bundle. And there's a unique abelian vortex supported in this U2 bundle. So this is like sort of the cobordism and picture that you see again. There's a, another projectively flat connection hiding around, but appears in a, it appears in a different isomorphism class of U2 bundle. So here, like you found two projectively flat connections and the point carrier homology is here, right? Like has two irreducible SU2 representations. So everything good, N nothing weird, like I've said. But uh, and again, 
either you look at the expected dimensions of the moduli spaces or do this argument that I mentioned earlier for showing this, uh, the moduli space of vortices has to be empty because there are no abelian vortices that can live in these moduli spaces. They just start becoming empty. All the others, like there are no SO3 vortices, irreducible SO3 vortices in either of the other cases. So you just get, if you pull back everything to the uh, sigma 235, uh, you get sort of this picture where you have like this one of these cyber width and monopoles uh, connected in a way with one of these irreducible SU2 connections, and then you have the other SU2 connection like on its own. And uh, I thought this is cute. Again, more food for thought and I'm also, um, will be done with this. Because morally, we know thanks to tau, that so Cassin invariant is like one half the number of flat connections on a, say, like an interior cohomology sphere. Now, uh, morally, Cassin invariant would also be the count of cyber with the monopoles if it were not for the fact that you have to add like a correction term, right? So that this is sort of like actually true. But uh, what it is still interesting, if you thought this like somewhat seriously, uh, this is sort of saying that like the number of irreducible flat connections is twice as many as the number of cyber with the monopoles. This is sort of an example where this happens on the nose, right? Which is not what you expect in general, but it's sort of interest like it's sort of happen it's not like an artificial example right it's sort of naturally suggest just suggested by looking at what the SO3 monopole equations was telling you so that's what I think it looks makes it somewhat interesting um, you can also do something similar for sigma 237 and, and this one is a little bit more tricky so I won't go into the details but after you do some work like the first natural can, uh, thing that works uh, has also something similar where like this cohort this and picture is uh, gets repeated. So there's like a one dimensional moduli space connecting one of the abelian vortices to an uh, irreducible flat connection. And then you have this other flat connection on its own. So I think I got uh, two minutes late. So thanks uh, for your patience. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I think we should do it. Thank you, Marino. Um, are there questions if we have a few to squeeze in? Well, kind of silly question. Uh, those two irreducible flat connections for sigma 235, mm -hmm. uh, which one of them is connected to the Zyberg Witten monopole? Yeah, they, 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 they differ by Floyer index, for example. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sorry, could, could you repeat the last part? I didn't hear it. Uh, do, do you know which one it is? Which which uh, oh, 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 I see, I see. I haven't done that index calculation. Right, right, right. That would also be interesting to to figure out. Yes, yeah, yeah, I agree. A couple of things left. In fact, what I would have said is that what is next, next is finishing MOY for SO3 monopoles. Meaning if you look at MOY, the large part of the paper, like two thirds at least, is like describing like the, flow lines for the Chern-Simons function, Dirac functional in terms of holomorphic geometry. That's my long-term goal. But you know, a Dirac geometry in complex dimension two is a little bit more complicated than complex dimension one. But like eventually I do want to kind of do all these index computations like, but I thought, oh, let's just write something down. So, uh, but yeah, I do want like all those questions like they're very natural and I, I want to finish uh, writing them down. Yeah, yeah. So if you hear back from me again, I succeeded. If I disappeared, that means I failed, so. <laughs> Don't disappear. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hopefully, there won't be a divorce in the movie, so it will be a happy ending. <laughs> uh, do you have any conjectural picture for the identity between between uh, Cass and variant being? Um, well, you said on the next to the last slide number of Zyberg with a monopole. Oh, have. right, right. Uh, I mean, we can see it in uh, in this particular example, but is there a conjectural picture how it's going to go? Uh, well, I think as long, again, um, I could have kept doing examples, but I thought like uh, one needs to understand a little bit better the flow lines, but I think as long as the for example, if you were working with this, like Briscoe uh, and homology spheres, because uh, in Fintuition Stern's paper, one knows that when there are three singular fibers, they're all isolated, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to find the bundle so that still like the abelian vortices are uh, 
uh, that appear in this picture are still zero dimensional, right? Like just points. I think like this will keep holding on the nose. Like once, but in general, I think you would expect a uh, higher dimensional abelian vortices as molecular spaces just to show up. And there, uh, I, I think there should be like an Euler, like, you know, like, um, like sort of multiple Photon, photon McPherson or like some sort of normal bond like you need to look at the other characteristic of a certain bundle and like uh, it would be like a uh, it, it would like it would be like the the, the count of the scattering invariant is sort of like a, uh, it's like a, I think like a two-dimensional version of like the formulas that you can find in Paul's and Tom's papers like uh, when like if the, like the Sarah Witten moduli spaces are higher dimensional I think something like that will happen but uh, I have to think more carefully about uh, yeah how the picture would look like but yeah there should be something that says like at least from this perspective that uh, the Cassin invariance has some sort of contributions over the cyber with the monopoles. Uh, uh, do, do you expect that the flow lines will provide some kind of bijection? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, well, maybe or something. I mean bijection seems too strong though. Yeah well I don't know. Yeah, because if there were, will be uh, flow lines going from monopoles to to flat connections. Right. When you, when one is look, I mean, again, this is sort of like the thing of the movie. Like where one knows like what what you should look at, or you should look at like some sort of stable pairs on like a compactification of the cylinder because that's what M O Y do, do right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, if I were Freeman or Morgan or both at the same time, then probably I would know the answers to these questions a lot easier. But for me, like, like just like looking at their like stable bundles and root surfaces and things like that is they're like tricky papers if you actually want like concrete answers. But I think like, for example, for, for carrying homology sphere or something like that, uh, I think one should be able to get a, a complete description of everything that's going on. Like that's my uh, ex like, Hope, uh, but yes, I'll keep you posted in a couple of weeks to see how things uh, keep evolving. But yeah, like one sort of knows what one needs to look at. Uh, I'm starting with the complex geometry picture just because I find that more fun. And then you just cross your fingers that as you check the analysis, like all this bijection, like uh, things that you have to prove uh, end up working. And then more or less, uh, and, and that ends up happening. Yeah, yeah.